This is Space Time Series 24, Episode 51. Coming up on Space Time, China launches its new space station. Moxie shows how to make oxygen on Mars. And carbon dioxide rich water discovered inside an ancient meteorite. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. China has successfully launched the first module of its new space station, giving the Chinese Communist Party a permanent presence in space. The 22,600 kg Tianhe, or Heavenly Harmony module, was blasted into orbit aboard a Long March 5B rocket from the Wenchang Satellite Launch Center on the southern island province of Henan. The 17-metre module will form the core of Beijing's new orbiting outpost, with at least 10 more missions planned to complete construction of the facility. The core module is designed to provide life support and living quarters for a crew of three for up to six months and provides guidance, navigation and orientation controls for the station. It includes a docking hub with a series of ports at one end, a habitation section in the middle and a service section at the other end housing the station's power, propulsion and life support systems. At least two more modules are planned at this time. The 20-ton Wen Tian or Quest for the Heavens and Meng Tian, or Dreaming of the Heavens modules, will each be about 14.4 metres long and provide orbital laboratories for research. When completed later next year, the T-shaped space station is expected to have a mass of around 66 tonnes, orbiting at an altitude of around 380 kilometres. However, Beijing says it could ultimately expand out to as many as six modules. The launch came as Russia announced plans to develop a joint lunar space station with China and to leave the International Space Station in 2025, withdraw from being part of the Lunar Gateway Space Station project and to build its own space station in low Earth orbit. In October 2003, Beijing became only the third nation on Earth capable of launching a human into space. China launched a pair of experimental single-module space stations, Tiangong or Heavenly Palace 1, and its successor Tiangong 2. The first burnt up and crashed back to Earth after it went out of control and its orbit decayed. The second undertook a successful controlled deorbit re-entry in 2018. Right now, Beijing's training at least 12 Taikonauts to live and work on the space station, the first spacecraft to visit the Tianhe core module should be the Tianji-2 cargo ship later this month. That'll be followed by the Shenzhou-12 capsule carrying three Taikonauts in June. The Tianju-3 cargo ship and the Shenzhou-13 manned spacecraft are also scheduled to visit the space station in September and October, respectively. This is Space Time. Still to come, Moxie makes oxygen on Mars and carbon dioxide-rich water found in an ancient meteorite. All that and more still to come on Space Time. An experiment aboard NASA's Mars Perseverance rover has for the first time successfully produced oxygen out of the red planet's thin carbon dioxide atmosphere. While much of the attention of late has been on the historic first flight on another planet by NASA's Mars Ingenuity helicopter, the Mars Perseverance rover, which carried the little rotorcraft on its 278 million kilometre journey from Earth to the Red Planet, has been undertaking important research of its own. The car-sized six-wheeled rover landed in Jezero Crater on February the 18th. Its primary mission is to search for signs of ancient life but a number of ancillary missions are also underway, and one of those is MOXIE, the Mars Oxygen In Situ Resource Utilization Experiment. It's designed to test the process for converting carbon dioxide into oxygen. Carbon dioxide makes up about 96% of the Martian atmosphere, while oxygen makes up just a tiny fraction, just 0.13%. Now, by comparison, here on Earth, oxygen makes up about 21% of the atmosphere. The toaster-sized Moxie is mounted in a small gold box incorporated into the Mars Perseverance rover. It uses solid oxide electrolysis technology to produce oxygen out of carbon dioxide, 
And in the early evening on April the 20th, or early morning Sol 60, Mission Time on Mars is measured in Sols or Martian days, the process produced 5.4 grams of oxygen directly out of the carbon dioxide atmosphere. MOXIE's oxygen production process involves taking in atmospheric carbon dioxide, which is then compressed and filtered to remove dust and other contaminants. It's then heated to over 800 degrees Celsius in order to split the carbon dioxide into oxygen and carbon monoxide. The system has the potential to produce up to 12 grams of oxygen an hour. That's about the same as a tree on Earth. The experiment is an important step in developing manned missions to Mars. See, both people and rocket engines breathe oxygen. For example, a team of four astronauts will need to breathe about a ton of oxygen during their year-long stay on the Red Planet. But to launch those same four people off the surface of Mars and back towards the Earth will require more than 25 tonnes of oxygen, as well as seven tonnes of propellant. Mission managers now want to test MOXIE under a range of different conditions, at different times of the day and over different seasons. This is space time. Still to come, carbon dioxide rich water found in an ancient meteorite and the constellation Scorpius the Scorpion, the spectacular M4 globular cluster, and the Eta Aquarids meteor shower are among the highlights of the May night skies on Skywatch. Scientists have found water inclusions containing at least 15% carbon dioxide in an ancient meteorite. The findings, reported in the journal Science Advances, suggest that this meteorite, which was part of the famous Sutter's Mill impact event, was most likely formed in the outer solar system somewhere beyond the orbit of Jupiter. Water is abundant in the solar system. In its liquid form, it's a prerequisite for life as we know it. Beyond Earth, astronomers have found water ice on the Moon, on Mars, on the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, as well as in Saturn's spectacular ring system, and of course, in comets and asteroids. And liquid water has also been detected beyond the Earth in our solar system, including on Mars and under the surface of the Saturnian moon Enceladus. And there's also strong evidence for a liquid water ocean beneath the crust of the frozen ice moon Europa. And it doesn't end there. Traces of water vapour have been detected in the scorching atmosphere of Venus. Scientists have also found water in the form of hydroxyl molecules on the lunar surface and in meteorites as hydrous minerals. These are basically solids with some ionic or molecular water incorporated within them. Even more exciting, microscopically small droplets of liquid water have been found in aqueous fluid inclusions inside the minerals of some meteorites. Akira Tsuchiyama from Ritsumekin University wanted to see if he could find liquid water inclusions in a form of calcium carbonate calcite in samples of the Sutter's Mill meteorite. The Sutter's Mill meteor was a carbonaceous chondrite which airburst on April 22, 2012 in the skies above Sutter's Mill, California. Sutter's Mill was best known for sparking the California gold rush. 79 fragments of the 4.6 billion year old meteor have so far been recovered. Using advanced microscopy, Sushiyama and colleagues found a calcite crystal containing a nanoscale aqueous fluid liquid water inclusion with at least 15% carbon dioxide. The presence of these inclusions within the Sutter's Mill meteorite has interesting implications concerning the origin of the meteor's parent asteroid and the early history of our solar system. The inclusions likely occurred due to the parent asteroid forming with bits of frozen water and carbon dioxide inside it. This would require the asteroid to have formed in a part of the solar system cold enough for water and carbon dioxide to freeze. And these conditions would place the site of formation far outside the orbit of Earth and likely even beyond the orbit of Jupiter. The asteroid must then have been transported to the inner regions of the solar system where fragments could later collide with the Earth. Now, this hypothesis is consistent with recent theoretical studies of the solar system's evolution, suggesting that asteroids rich in small, volatile molecules like water and carbon dioxide formed well beyond Jupiter's orbit in the cold outer reaches of the solar system and were then flung into the inner solar system through gravitational perturbations caused by the planetary migration of Jupiter and Saturn. 
and we know, thanks to evidence of the late heavy bombardment, that Jupiter and Saturn's outward migration occurred about 3.9 billion years ago, which would have been when the asteroid which produced the Sutter's Mill meteorite fragments would have been flung into the inner solar system. So, you see, these findings are providing important insights into the processes that work in the solar system during its early history. This is Space Time. The world has paid tribute to Apollo 11 Command Module pilot, astronaut Michael Collins, who has passed away aged 90. Collins was best known for remaining aboard the Apollo 11 Command Module in 1969, while fellow astronauts Neil Armstrong and Edwin Buzz Aldrin travelled down to the lunar surface to undertake man's historic first steps on the moon. In a brief statement, the Collins family said the former test pilot and astronaut died of cancer. In 1979, to mark the 10th anniversary of the moon landing, Collins said it was human nature to stretch, to go, to see, to understand. He said exploration was not really a choice, but an imperative. Born on October 31, 1930, Collins flew F-86 Sabre fighters for the US Air Force before becoming a military test pilot where he flew B-57 Cameras, T-33 Shooting Stars and F-104 Starfighters. His first spaceflight was aboard Gemini 10 in 1966. Fellow Apollo 11 astronaut Neil Armstrong, the first man to walk on the surface of another world, passed away back in 2012. Now, only Buzz Aldrin remains, although both Armstrong and Collins will live on forever in history. This is Space Time. And time now to turn our eyes to the skies and check out the celestial sphere for the month of May on Skywatch. May is the fifth month of the year in both the Julian and Gregorian calendars. The month was named for the Greek goddess Maya, who was identified with the Roman-era goddess of fertility Bonadia, whose festival was held in May. But I guess more importantly for many of our listeners, May typically marks the start of summer vacation season in the United States and Canada. Let's start our tour of the night skies by looking east, where you'll see the constellation Scorpius the Scorpion. In Greek mythology, the constellation was named after Scorpius, who was sent to Earth by the goddess Gaia, in order to slay Orion the Hunter, after he boasted that he could kill all the animals on Earth. Scorpius stung Orion in the shoulder. But Orion's life was spared by Ophiuchus the Healer, and it was placed in the heavens along with Scorpius, who continues to pursue him for eternity. Orion the Hunter has become the hunted forever, with Scorpius rising in the east this time of year to triumphantly chase and defeat Orion, who sets in the west. Meanwhile, Ophiuchus the healer rises in the east following behind Scorpius to chase and crush him into the earth as the scorpion sets in the west. And so, this ancient story continues to play out in the heavens year after year. Interestingly, parts of this story predate the Greeks, with Orion known in ancient Egypt as Osiris, the god of the underworld and of regeneration. The brightest star in Scorpius is Alpha Scorpi, or Antares, the scorpion's heart. In ancient Greek, the name Antares means the equal or rival of Mars, the god of war. That's because its golden orange appearance is similar to that of the red planet, and it passes very close to Mars every 780 years. Easily seen with the unaided eye, Antares is some 550 light years away. But it looks so bright because it's around 57,500 times as luminous as the Sun and is one of the largest known stars in the universe. Antares is a red supergiant, 
about 18 times the mass and 883 times the diameter of the sun. Were it placed where the sun is in our solar system, it would engulf all the terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars, and its visible surface would extend almost as far out as Jupiter. A light year is about 10 trillion kilometres. The distance a photon can travel in a year at 300,000 kilometres per second, the speed of light in a vacuum, and the ultimate speed limit of the universe. Astronomers believe Antares began life around 12 million years ago as a spectrotype O or B blue star. Astronomers describe stars in terms of spectral types, a classification system based on temperature and characteristics. The hottest, most massive and most luminous stars are known as spectrotype O blue stars. They're followed by spectrotype B blue-white stars, then spectrotype A white stars, spectrotype F whitish-yellow stars, spectrotype G yellow stars, that's where our sun fits in, then there's spectrotype K orange stars, and the coolest and least massive stars are known as spectrotype M red stars. Each spectral classification system can also be subdivided using a numeric digit to represent temperature, with zero being the hottest and nine the coolest. And then you add a Roman numeral to represent luminosity. So put it all together and you can describe our sun as being a G2V or G25 yellow dwarf star, one of millions spread across our galaxy. Also included in the stellar classification system are spectral types L, T and Y, which are assigned to failed stars known as brown dwarves, some of which were actually born as spectrotype M red stars, but became brown dwarves after losing some of their mass. Brown dwarves fit into a unique category between the largest planets, which are about 13 times the mass of Jupiter, and the smallest spectrotype M red dwarf stars, which are about 75 to 80 times the mass of Jupiter, or 0.08 solar masses. Like the similar-sized red giant Betelgeuse in the constellation Orion, Antares will almost certainly end its life as a spectacular Type II or core collapse supernova, probably sometime within the next 100,000 years or so. When it does explode, it will appear as bright as the full moon for several months on end and will be clearly visible during daylight hours here on Earth. Antares has a companion star, Antares B, located between 224 and 529 astronomical units away from the primary. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, which is about 150 million kilometres or 8.3 light minutes. Spectral analysis of Antares B indicates it's pulling a lot of material off its bloated red supergiant companion. Located near Antares is the M4 globular cluster. Globular clusters are tight balls densely packed with thousands to millions of stars, which were either all originally formed at the same time from the collapse of the same molecular gas and dust cloud, or alternatively, their galactic centres, the remains of ancient galaxies that have been merged into the Milky Way galaxy over billions of years. M4 is composed of a million or so stars originally born some 12 billion years ago. The M4 globular cluster is located some 7,200 light years away, making it one of the nearest globular clusters to Earth. Easily seen through a pair of small binoculars, it covers an area of the sky as seen from Earth as big as the full moon. Astronomers estimate there are some 150 or so globular clusters orbiting in the halo of the Milky Way. Located near the tail of the Scorpion are two open star clusters known as M6 and M7. Open star clusters are loosely bound groups of a few thousand stars, which were all originally formed from the same molecular gas and dust cloud at the same time, but are not as densely bound as globular clusters. Open clusters generally survive for a few hundred million years, with the most massive ones surviving for maybe a few billion years. Now, in contrast, the far more massive globular clusters exert far stronger gravitational attraction on their members, which is why they can survive so much longer. M6, which is also known as the Butterfly Cluster, is some 12 light-years across and located about 1,600 light-years away. It contains around 80 stars, which are all less than 100 million years old, which is quite young in cosmic terms. The M7, or Ptolemy Cluster, is named after the famous Greek astronomer and mathematician Claudius Ptolemy. It's about 980 light-years away and is far more dispersed than M6, covering an area around 25 light-years across and at around 200 million years, it's about twice as old. By the way, the M in terms like M4, M6 and M7 are abbreviations for Messier, 
in honor of the 18th century French astronomer Charles Messier, who developed an astronomical catalogue of fuzzy nebulous objects in the skies. See, Messier was a comet hunter, and he compiled a list of 103 fuzzy objects which weren't comets, and so, from his perspective, could be ignored. Later, other astronomers added additional celestial objects to the list, bringing the present catalogue up to 110. Our solar system, in fact most of the stars we see when we look up in the night sky, are located in the Milky Way galaxy's Orion Arm. The Orion Arm, also known as the Orion Spur or the Orion Cygnus Arm, depending on which name you prefer, is some 3,500 light years wide and around 10,000 light years long. The Orion Arm is named after the Orion constellation, which is one of the most prominent constellations in the Southern Hemisphere summer and Northern Hemisphere winter. Some of the brightest and most famous celestial objects in the constellation include Betelgeuse, Rigel, the stars of the Orion Belt, and the Orion Nebula, all located within the Orion Arm. The Orion Arm is located between the Carina Sagittarius Arm, which is more towards the galactic center from our position, and the Perseus Arm, which is more towards the outer edge of the galaxy from our point of view. The Perseus Arm is one of the two major arms of the Milky Way, the other being the Scutum Centaurus Arm. Long thought of as a minor structure, a spur if you will, between the two longer adjacent arms, Perseus and Carina Sagittarius, evidence was presented in mid-2013 that the Orion arm might actually be a branch of the Perseus arm, or possibly a completely independent arm segment itself. Within the Orion arm, our solar system, the Sun, the Earth and all the other planets we know, are located close to the inner rim in what's known as the local bubble, about halfway along the Orion arm's length, approximately 26,000 light-years from the galactic centre. The local bubble is a cavity in the interstellar medium in the Orion Arm, containing, among other things, the local interstellar cloud, which contains our solar system, and the G-cloud. It's at least 300 light-years across, and it has a neutral hydrogen density of just 0.05 atoms per cubic centimetre. That's just one-tenth of the average for the interstellar medium across the Milky Way, and about a sixth that of the local interstellar cloud. The hot diffuse gas in the local bubble emits X-rays and is the result of a supernova that exploded sometime during the past 10 to 20 million years. It was once thought that the most likely candidate for the remains of this supernova was Juminga, a pulsar in the constellation Gemini. However, later it was suggested that multiple supernovae in a subgroup B1 of the Pleiades moving group was more likely responsible, becoming a remnant supershell. Our solar system has been travelling through this region of space occupied by the local bubble for the last 5 to 10 million years. Its current location is in what's known as the local interstellar cloud, a minor region of slightly denser material within the bubble. The cloud formed when the local bubble and another bubble called the Loop 1 bubble met. Gas within the local interstellar cloud has a density of about 0.3 atoms per cubic centimetre. From what we can tell, the local bubble isn't spherical, but seems to be narrower in the galactic plane, becoming somewhat egg-shaped or elliptical, and may even become wider above and below the galactic plane, becoming shaped more like an hourglass. And it's not alone, it's abutting other bubbles of lesser dense interstellar medium, including the Loop 1 bubble. The Loop 1 bubble was created by supernovae and stellar winds in the Scorpius Centaurus Association some 500 light years from the Sun. The Loop 1 bubble also contains the star Antares that we spoke about earlier. Astronomers have identified several, well, I guess you'd call them tunnels, which connect the cavities of the local bubble with that of the Loop 1 bubble. Collectively, they've been referred to as the Lupus Tunnel. Other bubbles which are adjacent to our local bubble are known as the Loop 2 bubble and the Loop 3 bubble. Looks like astronomers still have a problem when it comes to thinking up cool names. Also visible this month is the Eta Aquarids meteor shower, which is generated as the Earth passes through the dust and debris trail left behind by Halley's Comet. Comet P1 Halley is a well-known short-period comet which visits the inner solar system every 75 to 76 years. The 15-kilometre-wide mountain of rock and ice will make its next close-up appearance in 2061. It's named in honour of the British astronomer Edmund Halley, who in 1705, after examining ancient Chinese, Babylonian and medieval European records, successfully predicted its return in 1758. However, he died in 1742, before his prediction could be confirmed. 
The comet's highly elliptical and elongated orbit takes it from between the orbits of Mercury and Venus out almost as far as the orbit of Pluto. Halley's orbit is in retrograde, meaning it orbits the Sun in the opposite direction to the planets, that is, clockwise from above the Sun's northern pole. This retrograde orbit results in it having one of the highest velocities relative to the Earth of any object in the solar system, travelling at some 70.56 kilometres per second, or if you prefer, 254,016 kilometres per hour. As well as the Eto Acrid's meteor shower every May, Halley's Comet also produces the Orionids meteor shower in late October. Astronomers think Comet Halley was originally a long-period comet, which took thousands of years to travel to the inner solar system from the Oort cloud, but was gravitationally perturbed into its current orbit by close encounters with the giant outer planets. The Oort cloud is a hypothetical sphere of comets and asteroids beyond the heliosphere, a mixture of vagabonds from the solar system and objects from deep space which have been collected by the Sun's gravitational pull. Occasionally, as the Sun passes by another star, an Oort cloud object will get perturbed and be flung towards the inner solar system. The Eta Acrid's meteor shower runs from the 19th of April through to the 28th of May, peaking around May the 5th with around 55 meteors an hour, making it one of the Southern Hemisphere's best celestial showers. However, back in 1975, they were running 95 meteors an hour, and in 1980, it was up to 110. Even better, the bright yellow meteors often appear as streaks known as trains. As their name suggests, they radiate out from the direction of the constellation Aquarius and the star Eta Aquarii. Just look towards the east after midnight and before dawn for the best view. Joining us now is Jonathan Nully from Australian Sky and Telescope magazine for the rest of our tour of the May night skies on Skywatch. Good day, Stuart. Well, in the southern hemisphere down here, we're heading into winter, of course, and our friends in the north going into summer. So different things to see in the night sky. Winter is a great time for stargazing in the southern hemisphere, even though it's cold. I mean, it's getting cold. I mean, I know I know, in Australia here we don't have real cold compared to other parts of the world, but for us it feels cold. And uh, going out in the night air, you might think, oh, I don't want to go out there, it's too cold, nothing to see. But there's actually lots and lots, there's lots of great stuff to see at this time of year. It's probably the best time of year for some things. So where will we start? We'll start down the south. We normally start down the south. We'll start down the south. You've got the Southern Cross, which for once is standing upright. At this time of year, it's, it's up nice and high and it's standing up straight up and down. It looks like a kite shape. It's not a not a, like a plus symbol cross. It's a, it's it's like a, crucifix, a crucifix cross. Yeah. A crucifix cross, yeah. In fact, the um, proper name for the constellation is not Southern Cross. It is Crooks, C-R-U-X. Crooks is the, is the proper pronunciation of it, and that means like a crucifix. So that's really easy to see at the moment. You've got the, the two-pointer stars in Centaurus near it. They're, they're very easy to see as well. And you've got the these wonderful constellations we talk about a lot. You've got Carina and Vela of Puppets, which are the old constellations of the Argo Navis constellation, full of wonderful star fields and nebulae. You can just get some binoculars and sweep through there. Lots and lots of great stuff to see. There's the, the star cluster Omega Centauri that you can spot. It's 17,000 light years away. It's a it's a globular cluster on the outskirts of our galaxy. It's got 10 million stars in it. And even with a pair of binoculars, you're not going to make out individual stars, but you can see it's like this little ball, little intense ball in space. It's not a point source like a star. And it's, it's not doesn't look like a planet. It doesn't look like a nebula. It's this ball of stars, 10 million of them, 17,000 light years away. It's, it's fabulous to look at it and think, okay, it might not look much, but when you think of what it is, it's quite amazing that you can see it. You can actually even spot it with the unaided eye if you are in a dark enough spot and your eyes are dark adapted. So what do you think? Is it the heart of a, another galaxy that was eaten by the Milky Way or do you think it's just a really thick grouping of stars that all formed at the same time? Which side of the debate are you on? Uh, I'm, I'm sitting on the fence on that one. Because, uh, yeah, they were, for, for a long time, of course, they were just considered, uh, globular clusters are considered to be groups of stars yeah. that formed all in the same sort of spot. When and, I went to um, uni, that's what they were. That's what they were considered, but... The tide is changing, my friend. Yeah, some people consider that they are the sort of heart of um, smaller galaxies Mm. that um, have been stripped of all the other stars and gas and stuff, and they're just what's left. Because the Milky Way has gobbled up lots of galaxies uh, over the years. And, I mean, 30, 40 years ago, we knew that it might have gobbled up one or two, but uh, now, you know, it's it's gobbled up a lot more and it's in in the process of continuing to do so. So, um, yeah, it wouldn't at all surprise me one way or the other uh, whether these globular clusters are, um, at least some of them, the, the remnants of small galaxies that got gobbled up or whether they are their own thing. But anyway, the thing is that you can go out and have a look at it. You can, you can see it with the unaided eye just as a small fuzzy point of light. 
get some binoculars on it. And if you've got a telescope, of course, it'll look even, look even better. It'll look great. In fact, Omega Centauri is the best looking mm. uh, globular star cluster in the entire sky. And it's wow. very far south, so you can only see it from here. So if you get a chance to have a look at it, please do. And not far from it, you've got another thing that you can see too, which also looks like a little fuzzy blob of light to the unaided eye. Looks better through binoculars and looks great through a telescope. And that's a galaxy called NGC 5128 sometimes called Centaurus A. It's a weird-looking galaxy. It's got this big, dark dust lane going through it, and it's in the shape of a ball with this big, dark dust lane sort of splitting it in half. Some people call it the Hamburger Galaxy because it looks a bit like that, I suppose. A lot of people use the the name Centaurus A for the galaxy. Some people call it by its catalogue number, NGC 5128. I was slapped on the wrist by an astronomer years and years and years ago for calling the galaxy Centaurus A, but Centaurus A really refers to the radio source that is inside the galaxy. The, the galaxy itself is catalogued as NGC 5128. This is not going to mean a lot to most people listening, but I just thought I'd mention it because I did get slapped on the wrist by a famous astronomer. I said, you shouldn't call it Centaurus A, the source of radio waves coming from the inside of the galaxy itself. It's catalogued in that number 5128. But it's 10 to 15 million light years away, and you can see it. You can actually see this thing with a pair of binoculars, get onto it, and it just looks looks, looks fantastic. So see if you can spot that. Of course, you're going to need a star map to have a look at that or, or some sort of program or an app on your mobile phone, but um, it's, it's pretty easy to find. And Centaurus A is one of the strongest radio sources in the sky as well, which is one of its claims to fame. Speaking of a claim to fame, you mentioned Omega Centauri a moment ago. It was discovered by a local Sydney boy, James Dunlop, who lived in the Sydney suburb of Parramatta. Uh, 1826, I think, from memory. Back then, of course, Parramatta wasn't drowned in the bright lights of the city like it is now. That's back in the days when you had people who were called gentlemen astronomers. Yes. They, yeah. they they typically had other jobs. They might have been someone in the government or might have been a solicitor or this or that. But their real passion was astronomy and they were independently wealthy and, and they could build themselves around little observatory. And while, of course, the indigenous populations of the, the southern countries had long looked at the sky, and did the best they could with the naked eye, uh, was only when, I suppose, European technology reached the southern latitudes with telescopes and things that people could start discovering things that were not visible to the unaided eye, things like galaxies and star clusters, yeah. that kind of thing. So these people who were called gentlemen astronomers, they could do it. They did a lot of that back then. They weren't professional scientists. Most people weren't professional. Even even scientists were professional scientists back in those days. They had, you know, a lot of them uh, just, just did it for the love of it. Indeed, uh, Parramatta was the, the second settlement in, in Sydney. You had uh, the, the settlement in Sydney Cove, and then you had the European settlement, of course, the European settlement in Sydney Cove, and then the first place outside of Sydney was, was Parramatta, where the old government house still stands. And yeah, you can go there and you can see the remains of observatories there. It's quite a historic place, at least in Australian terms. And you did all um, this in 1826. I was very young long back time, then. Long time ago, but not too not too long after um, the British arrived in Australia mm. and, and set up camp. Pretty amazing, really. Life was very hard back then, so it was great that some astronomy was getting done. Over in the west, uh, where the sun has just set, of course, uh, and it's nice and dark now, You've got the constellation Orion, which we talk about a lot, but it is setting. So it's basically gone for the year. Won't, won't be back until summertime for us. Nearby, you've got Sirius, which is the brightest star in the night sky and the brightest star in the constellation Canis Major, or the Greater Dog. A little bit to the north is another fairly bright star called Procyon, which is the brightest star in Canis Minor, the Lesser Dog. Both of those are really lovely, beautiful, bright stars. The northern half of the sky this time of year for us down the south doesn't seem to be very interesting. doesn't have many bright stars. It's a bit bare. There are some famous constellations there, though. You've got Leo and Cancer and Virgo. They're ones in the zodiac, of course. And astronomers, amateur astronomers, love Virgo because there are some big galaxy clusters in there. You can't see it with the naked eye, but you get some telescopes onto it and, uh, and you can see these, uh, these amazing galaxies. But if you wait a few hours until around midnight or so, then some mighty constellations are coming up over the eastern horizon this time of year and I'm talking about in particular Sagittarius and Scorpius because those uh, two constellations are right in the middle of the Milky Way. Sagittarius in fact when you look in that direction of that you're looking towards the middle of the Milky Way our galaxy and that means there's lots and lots of stuff to see. You've got incredible star fields and star clusters and nebulae. You get some binoculars onto that area. It's just tremendous. It really is amazing. So that's one of the reasons why particularly southern astronomers love wintertime because the centre of our galaxy 
is up nice and high in the sky and can be seen. So it's great from an amateur astronomer perspective, lots of stuff to see. It's great from a professional astronomer perspective because there are lots of interesting objects, including the, the black hole in the middle of our galaxy and lots of other stuff that are in, in the thick of it, if you like, because we're looking into the, the heart, into the, the dense inner regions of our galaxy. So that's really one of the reasons why that uh, Southern Hemisphere astronomy is so good, and that is because our galaxy center is up nice and high. So in the Northern Hemisphere, it's down very low on the horizon or, or fairly low on the horizon where you don't get as good a view. Anyway, let's have a look at what's happening with the planets. Now, both of the inner planets, Mercury and Venus, well, they've been out of view for a while. They were, they were out of view pretty much uh, all of a lost in the sun's glare. But both of them are going to slowly start to reappear above the western horizon after sunset during May. Mercury won't get very high. Uh, might be a bit hard to see. Could be impossible to see if you've got hills and trees and buildings and things in the way. But Venus, which is nice and big and bright, will slowly get higher and higher above the western horizon, that is, and it will continue climbing higher as the next few months progress. So you won't be able to miss, miss Venus. Still looking out roughly that direction, looking in the northwest after sunset, you should be able to see Mars, the planet Mars. Pretty easy to spot. It's not big and bright. In fact, it's getting dimmer and dimmer because it's a, quite a long way from us now. But pretty easy to spot because it looks like a medium brightness star with a really obvious uh, reddish, orangey sort of color. So that, that, should be, that should make it easy to have a look at. Um, and um, when you do that, uh, please bear in mind all the rovers and the helicopter and the satellites orbiting Mars at the moment. That's what I like to do. When I look at the planets, I think, what's there? You yeah, know? So uh, yeah, you yeah. Know, nothing at Saturn at the moment, but Mars, there's stacks of stuff at Mars. So you look at Mars and you think, that's you know, tens and tens and tens of millions of uh, kilometres away. And there are these little robots sent there from Earth and they're buzzing around there right now, even as we speak. It's just incredible to think about that, I think. Um, it's, it never never fails to amaze me. The other two planets we can see at the moment are Jupiter and Saturn, but you're going to have to wait up until about midnight or even beyond midnight to spot them rising in the east. Saturn rises first around about, oh, actually about quarter to midnight, uh, the beginning of May, but uh, a bit earlier towards the end of the month. Uh, and Jupiter follows about an hour later. Now, there's an eclipse of the moon coming up this month on May the 26th. Not everywhere in the world can see it, but fortunately for us, uh, people in New Zealand and Australia, are going to be able to see it, but it's not going to be a very long one. So an eclipse of the moon is where the moon goes into Earth's shadow, right? Typically, it lasts for a fair while, but yeah. this one, we're only going to get 18 minutes of totality, right? So the, you get the partial phase first, and the moon's going to go completely into the darkest part of Earth's shadow. That's called totality, and that's only going to last 18 minutes this time. The total phase is going to begin at about 10 past 9 in the evening, Eastern Australian time, so Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane time, and it will finish only 18 minutes later, about 9.28, and then it goes to the partial phase as it, as it eases out of the shadow again. Two weeks after that, there's going to be another eclipse. We won't see it down here. It's going to be an annular eclipse of the sun, and it's going to be seen across parts of the northern hemisphere, far northern parts of the northern hemisphere, Greenland, places like that. It's an annular eclipse of the sun, which means that um, it's, it's not quite total. When the moon moves in front of the sun, um, because the moon's a little bit further away from us in its orbit, it appears appears to be a bit smaller and it doesn't completely cover up the sun and you get this ring of fire effect, a thin ring, ring of sunlight still around the edge of the moon. Very which spectacular, is pretty spectacular. Right? Yeah, very spectacular. But, of course, you still shouldn't look at it because even 1% of the sun's sunlight is too bright for the naked eye. So you need to take all the standard precautions of uh, any sort of solar eclipse, even when you're only getting a tiny little thin ring of sunlight. Yeah, someone once described the eclipse of the moon and the reddish colour that it turns during such an event as seeing all the world's sunrises and sunsets at once. Yeah, that's nice, isn't it? You do know that, as George Gamow said that uh, famously a long time ago, that scientists have actually proved that the moon is better than the sun. How do they prove you know that? This? No, no, tell no, me. They've, no, they've proved that the moon's better than the sun because, well, you see, the moon, it shines at night yes. when everything's when dark. So yeah. When you need it, yeah, so you can see where you're going and everything. But the sun, well, it only shines during the daytime when it's light anyway. Boom, boom. There you go. That's Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And don't forget, if you're having trouble getting your copy of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine from your usual retailer because of the current lockdown and travel restrictions, you can always get a print or digital subscription and have the magazine delivered directly to your letterbox or inbox. Subscribing's easy. Just go to skyandtelescope.com.au. That's skyandtelescope.com.au and you'll never be left in the dark again.
that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. Bytes.com.